Hello and welcome to this edition of the Value Exchange. My name is Chris Kuiper, Director of Research for Fidelity Digital Assets. And today I'm joined by Christine Thompson and Yonatan Tekla, who are with the Advanced Technologies for Investment Management team here at Fidelity. Uh, Christine, let's start with you a little bit on your background and what you do at what we like to call ATIM, Advanced Technologies for Investment Management. Why don't I start with my background as an investor? I spent 32 years working in Fidelity's bond division as an analyst, a portfolio manager, and as a chief investment officer overseeing other portfolio managers. When it was time to do something new, I was given the opportunity at Fidelity to work on identifying ways that we might use transformative technologies to better inform client investment decision making. And we started ATIM in order to provide new ways to overcome some of the limitations of traditional financial modeling in order to help clients have more successful uh, investment outcomes. Excellent. And Yonatan, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at ATIM. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I joined ATIM about two years ago uh, after completing a PhD in the aeronautics department at MIT. I studied magnetic fluids there, uh, very different from modeling cryptocurrencies or, or financial assets, but we did a lot of modeling. During my time there, I had the opportunity to work at Fidelity with a couple of people who I consider my mentors now, um, uh, Frank Nielsen and Ren Cheng, who've, who've done a lot to advance um, quant research here at Fidelity. So I made my way to ATIM after that. So is it safe to say we can say you're a rocket scientist? Uh, some people say that. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. Every team needs one. <laughs> Absolutely. So when I was introduced to both of you and your team, uh, you showed me a model you were working on, and a light bulb went off in my head. This model was, was looking at uh, how to construct a portfolio, and you had recently added some data on digital assets, particularly Bitcoin. And of course, at Fidelity Digital Assets, one of the things we're always trying to look at is uh, how to think about Bitcoin, how to think about it in your portfolio. And we recently had a report by my colleague, Jack Newrider called Getting Off Zero, where we looked at your classic 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% fixed income. What would this have done if you had Bitcoin and if you didn't have Bitcoin, right? Of course, you know this is a good starting point. The past is the past. It is true. It happened. Uh, but the biggest criticism we always got was, number one, your history is very, very short. Bitcoin hasn't been in existence since 2009, hasn't really been traded uh, all that much for even a shorter period of time. And of course, as you know, the returns of Bitcoin have been absolutely fantastic. It's gone from literally nothing to over a trillion dollar asset class at one time. Uh, so these were the two hurdles we were facing. And uh, when I was introduced to your model, the light bulb went off of maybe this can help us overcome some of these limitations. So could you tell us about your model and how it relates to, to modeling things like Bitcoin? So maybe we should start with some background on the model itself and why we um, took the space that we were given to, to research sort of innovative ways to inform client investment decision making in the way that we did. If you work with traditional models, most of which are informed by modern port portfolio theory, what they're doing is they're looking at trying to understand the most common ways that investments interact. The problem with investment risk when you're, when you're, when you're evaluating it is that in times of market stress, you don't want the most common relationship between investments. You want when correlations change, when market liquidity influences are causing traditional relationships to fall apart. And part of the shortfalls of traditional quant modeling as it relates to risk return, risk return measurement is that they tend to underestimate risk when you go into periods of market stress. So looking at an asset like Bitcoin, yes, you've had tremendous upside. You've also had episodes of tremendous downside. And it's an asset and, and a question of how it blends with traditional assets that very much presents itself as, as a way that this type of generative machine learning modeling that we've advanced um, for use across Fidelity um, is intended to capture both those upsides and the downside potential in, an, in a framework that is reflective of what else is going on in the markets and in the economy. Interesting. So if I got this right, our, our kind of standard historical analysis is very static, right? Uh, but you're capturing these, these dynamic correlations, these changing correlations between asset classes. Is, is, is that correct? Yes. So uh, our models essentially take over 30 years of history and the, they learn from it. They learn how uh, the assets move relative to one another. Um, and from that, we can derive simulations uh, that then give us insight into 
how they may perform in other market environments that are similar to history, in market environments that are unprecedented. And then that also, you know, it's generative AI also uh, helps us take assets that didn't exist at one time and and like replay them back in history. So we could, for example, play out simulations of how Bitcoin might have performed in the great financial crisis. That's interesting because one of the, the biggest shortcomings of Bitcoin is its, is its short history period. Um, and also the, the narrative, right? People are always asking, well, how do I treat this? Is it a commodity? Is it a stock? Is it a network, a, a payment platform? And at Fidelity Digital Assets, we've explored many of these investment theses and narratives as well. But from a purely quantitative perspective, how does your team and the, and the model approach this question? Well, let me start by saying what we don't do. <laughs> we're not predicting the future of, of Bitcoin or any asset. Mm. Instead, we're looking at historical data and we're extracting from that what there is that we can ascertain by looking at the relationship of how Bitcoin prices have moved relative to a large range of other factors and other, in other in instruments. And then using that to impute um, data back in time so that we can look at a blended, um, in a blended way how Bitcoin would react based on what we have to analyze relative to other, other instruments. And then we don't predict a, you know, a single point going forward. Instead, we're looking at an expected probability distribution built on that history and that imputation of history. You, you mentioned a few different types of assets that Bitcoin may behave like, and in its short history, it's behaved like several of them, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's really important is how you model how these correlations change in time. And machine learning is actually pretty good at identifying shifts in the regime uh, of the asset. So we can look at transaction history, we can, uh, transaction volume history, we can, we can look at uh, return patterns and blend those together, looking at these machine learning models to identify points at which we say, oh, Bitcoin is no longer behaving like a store of value. It's now behaving as a risk asset. You know, and so we can take those data points into our model to help better inform how they would blend within a portfolio. Certainly. So lately, and we've been acutely aware of this, Bitcoin has traded like this growth stock on steroids, as people like to say. Its beta is very high, especially to technology stocks and other risk assets. Uh, and this is different from the norm. Uh, in previous history, Bitcoin has been very uncorrelated to things. So of course, everyone's question is, you know, is Bitcoin going to continue to stay correlated? Are traders and investors going to treat it like a risk asset? or will revert back to that uncorrelated nature. Uh, but what you're saying is you don't need to make a judgment on that. The model will continually take in new data and, and readjust accordingly. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've ever heard the sort of the old classic Greek quote, you know, a man never steps in the same river twice. It's <laughs> never the same river. It's never the same man or some variation of that. That's true also with financial market outcomes. History has commonalities. There is a man, there's a river. <laughs> but each episode of history is distinct. And so the, the point of the generative model that we've advanced is to pick up and, and incorporate those changes as they become apparent in price movements. All right, so let's get to the good stuff here, the answer everyone's been waiting for. Uh, you have a model. It can uh, show these dynamic correlations. It can look at Bitcoin from a purely quantitative perspective. Uh, what does it say? You know, in, in this paper that we worked on together, we, instead of starting with a 60-40 portfolio, we tried to use a little bit more of an institutional-like portfolio. So, you know, the specifics don't matter, but we added in some real estate, commodities, um, gold, a little bit of cash. Uh, and then we said, what happens when you add Bitcoin? So, so how does the model look at it and what did you find while running this? So I'll say the first thing that it, <laughs> that, that it tells us and that we, we try to really discuss uh, thoroughly in the paper is that inputs to your model matter, right? So the uh, investment horizon matters, the uh, return assumptions you have for Bitcoin matter, the return assumptions you have for the other assets in your portfolio matter. Um, and you need to take all of these things into consideration when um, trying to make investment allocation decisions. So that's that's the, the main thing that we discuss in the paper. And in the paper, we use um, historical return assumptions for the other assets, non-Bitcoin, and that allow, and then Bitcoin, we can make uh, multiple return assumptions, and it's important to look at uh, 
return assumptions in different ways. You may want to look at um, how, you know, your forward view on Bitcoin or any other asset and say, I think it's going to perform you know, like X, Y, Z. Or you can have a, a, a relative um, return assumption. So I can say, based on how equities has, have performed, um, Bitcoin will return you know, some multiple. Um, and then last, the market environment also matters. So you can make return assumptions based on how you think it will perform in a certain market environment. Yeah, I think those are the key things that, that matter uh, regarding your inputs um, when trying to understand how it might perform it within a portfolio. The other thing that um, an investor needs to think about is what their definition is of risk. Traditionally, um, investment risk is, is, is measured as volatility. And when you have an emerging asset, when you have um, an asset like Bitcoin, an investor really wants exposure to volatility on the upside. Mm -hmm. And so using volatility as a definition of something that's negative doesn't fully align with the use case of including an asset early in its life cycle, such as, such as digital assets. Instead, what, our, what Fidelity's generative AI model allows us to do is to define extreme loss as the definition of risk. And what we talk about in the paper is the creation of a different kind of investment frontier. What's the best um, outcome and the best asset mix that might align with an individual's um, specific tolerance for downs, extreme downside loss. And against that measure, what you find is that depending on the flexibility, meaning how much you allow your portfolio to reallocate from other assets, if you don't think that Bitcoin's going to outperform the traditional assets in your portfolio, um, you're probably not going to include it in your portfolio. If you have a view, if you have a fundamental view that the supply and, de and demand dynamics are improving and perhaps there's more neighborhood use cases for the asset that will cause um, demand to exceed supply and prices to rise, then you're going to want to include it. And in fact, what you see is that other, other riskier, more volatile assets will be cut back and the, and, the, and the model will show that you'll be encouraged to put consider more in your digital asset allocation, more in your extreme diversifiers, and generally their fixed income assets, and to cut back of traditional equity investments. Yeah, and I absolutely love how you show this in your model in the paper, where you take that traditional frontier and you kind of flip it around, where it's not just volatility. Volatility cuts both ways. Nobody cares when Bitcoin's volatile because it's going up and going to the moon, right? Good volatility. Uh, they care about the downside, the downside volatility. And you draw analogies of how it has that 100% loss potential, right? That's factored into it. But so do a lot of other equities that your model can, can draw on. And so I really like how you've shown that, um, once again, it depends on your inputs. But if you think there is a, a chance of Bitcoin outperforming these traditional assets, uh, then for a specific amount of loss, a, a specific amount of pain that someone's willing to endure, uh, they can get a lift in their returns to the portfolio by adding Bitcoin. And at a point when the price of Bitcoin were, were to change, if it were to change and start to reflect the theory or the, uh, again, the experience of the asset being perceived as a store of value. And so it disassociates its price movement from that of growth, early growth equities then the model will pick up on that and those allocations that are suggested from the loss, Fidelity's loss frontier, will also imply different reallocations within a portfolio. But for now, what you're seeing is that it's trading like a risk asset. And to the extent that you have flexibility, it's saying if you're gonna take risk, take it with something that has that two, three, four up fold upside potential relative to its downside potential. So, so in the paper, you know, we we, we make make these assumptions. We, we explain exactly what what they are, and we come to the conclusion that um, for those specific assumptions, and using using loss as as your definition of risk, that it makes sense to um, allocate some amount, you know, that you can stomach to Bitcoin, and then as as Christine mentioned, you can uh, remove allocations from. Uh, riskier assets uh, and reallocate them to safer havens, um, and then the the, the re return distributions that we saw, you know, we we were able to eliminate a lot of the really um, 
the, the extreme loss potential, the, the really the five percent tails, uh, downside tails, uh, and naturally they're replaced with some increase in moderate losses. But then you have uh, because you have Bitcoin in your profile in your uh, portfolio, you have access to the really high um, return potentials. That's really interesting and somewhat counterintuitive. Could you say more about that? Yeah. So someone might think it's counterintuitive because um, we we tend to think of uh, these risk estimates as, as point estimates, right? Rather than understanding entire return distributions of, of assets, right? Bitcoin has these really high highs, um, but as Christine mentioned, right, it can only go to negative 100%. So it's widely asymmetric. Um, and so our, the advantage of our model is that it can capture these really you know, high asymmetries uh, in, in return outcomes. Another thing I wanted to point out uh, was that um, another advantage of, of the uh, fidelity model is that we are able to capture um, market scenarios that are defined by uh, AART, which is um, the asset allocation research team. This macroeconomic research team um, spends a lot of time really studying history and, and market movements. AART has worked with our team to define multiple scenarios that may be very relevant to people in, uh, when they're constructing their portfolios, such as uh, rising interest rate environments, weak growth, phases of the business cycle. So having these scenarios be reflected in your portfolio when you're making investment decisions can change how you might allocate to different assets. So that's another thing you want, you know, we want to help investors take advantage of during the portfolio construction process. Which brings back to that tension between risk and return. Mm -hmm. There's times in the economic cycle, there's times in the financial markets when taking risk is more apt to translate into return. And there are other environments that repeatedly um, are those where risk can really undermine years of successful investing. And so having the framework to be able to differentiate and look at expected probabilities of outcomes, the asymmetric return patterns across a frontier at different investor risk thresholds is a very informative framework to help um, investors determine where do they think we are, where might we be, how much confidence do they have, and how much tolerance for pain um, are they willing to accept. Absolutely. It's a fascinating new way to look at this. Uh, I think it's pioneering and groundbreaking in many ways. So thank you so much, both of you, Christine and Yonatan, for being here. Uh, thank you for listening. This has been The Value Exchange with Fidelity Digital Assets. If you'd like to know more, go to fidelitydigitalassets.com, click on the research, and you can download our latest paper there. Thank you.